Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of Jehovah who made heaven and earth. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the operations of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's take our Psalter in hand this morning and let's sing Psalter number 27. Number 27. Before we sing, there are two announcements. The first is that young peoples will be canceled this morning due to the weather, so no young peoples this morning. And then the second announcement is that Mrs. Catherine Quaker was able to return home from the hospital yesterday. We give thanks for the measure of healing granted unto her. Psalm number 27, entitled, God the Highest Good. The lines are fallen unto me in places large and fair. A goodly heritage is mine marked out with gracious care. Let's sing the five stanzas, number 27. Let us hear now the law of the Lord as that law is read to us from Exodus chapter 20. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days thou shalt labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. 
in it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy son nor thy daughter, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. The summary of the law given to us by Jesus in the New Testament, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and the great commandment And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Let's respond now to the reading of God's holy law by singing Psalm number 66. Number 66. Titled The Look of Faith, based on Psalm 25. Let's sing the four stanzas, Psalter number 66. Let us now turn in the back of the Psalter to the form for the administration of baptism, found on pages 86 and following. (coughs) Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the principal parts of the doctrine of holy baptism are these three. First, that we with our children are conceived and born in sin. 
and therefore our children of wrath, insomuch that we cannot enter into the kingdom of God except we are born again. This, the dipping in or sprinkling with water, teaches us whereby the impurity of our souls is signified, and we, admonished to loathe and humble ourselves before God, and seek for our purification and salvation without ourselves. Secondly, holy baptism witnesseth and sealeth unto us the washing away of our sins through Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. For when we are baptized in the name of the Father, God the Father witnesseth and sealeth unto us that he doth make an eternal covenant of grace with us and adopts us for his children and heirs. And therefore will provide us with every good thing and avert all evil or turn it to our profit. And when we are baptized in the name of the Son, the Son sealeth unto us that he doth wash us in his blood from all our sins incorporating us into the fellowship of his death and resurrection so that we are freed from all our sins and accounted righteous before God. In like manner, when we are baptized in the name of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost assures us by this holy sacrament that he will dwell in us and sanctify us to be members of Christ, applying unto us that which we have in Christ, namely, the washing away of our sins and the daily renewing of our lives, till we shall finally be presented without spot or wrinkle among the assembly of the elect in life eternal. Thirdly, whereas in all covenants there are contained two parts, therefore are we by baptism admonished of and obliged unto new obedience, namely, that we cleave to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now we trust in Him and love Him with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our mind, and with all our strength. And we forsake the world, crucify our old nature, and walk in a new and holy life. And if we sometimes through weaknesses fall into sin, we must not therefore despair of God's mercy nor continue in sin, since baptism is a seal and undoubted testimony that we have an eternal covenant of grace with God. And although our young children do not understand these things, we may not therefore exclude them from baptism. For as they are without their knowledge partakers of the condemnation in Adam, so are they again received unto grace in Christ. As God speaketh unto Abraham, the father of all the faithful, and therefore unto us and our children, Genesis 17, verse 7, saying, I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. This also the apostle Peter testifieth, with these words in Acts 2, verse 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Therefore God formerly commanded them to be circumcised, which was a seal of the covenant and of the righteousness of faith. And therefore Christ also embraced them, laid his hands upon them, and blessed them. Mark 10. Since then, baptism is come in the place of circumcision. Therefore, infants are to be baptized as heirs of the kingdom of God and of his covenant. And parents are in duty bound further to instruct their children herein when they shall arrive to years of discretion. That therefore this holy ordinance of God may be administered to his glory, to our comfort, and to the edification of his church, let us now call upon his holy name in prayer. O Almighty and Eternal God, Thou who hast, according to Thy severe judgment, punished the unbelieving and unrepentant world with the flood, 
and hast according to thy great mercy saved and protected believing Noah and his family. Thou who hast drowned the obstinate Pharaoh and his host in the Red Sea, and hast led thy people Israel through the midst of the sea upon dry ground, by which baptism was signified, we beseech thee that thou wilt be pleased of thine infinite mercy, graciously to look upon these children and incorporate them by thy Holy Spirit into thy Son, Jesus Christ, that they may be buried with him into his death and be raised with him in newness of life, that they may daily follow him, joyfully bearing their cross and cleave unto him in true faith, firm hope and ardent love, that they may, with a comfortable sense of thy favor, leave this life, which is nothing but a continual death, and that the last day may appear without terror before the judgment seat of Christ thy Son, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with thee and the Holy Ghost, one only God, lives and reigns forever. Amen. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have heard that baptism is an ordinance of God to seal unto us and to our seed his covenant. Therefore, it must be used for that end, and not out of custom or superstition, that it may then be manifest that you are thus minded. You are asked now to rise and answer sincerely to these questions. First, whether you acknowledge that although our children are conceived and born in sin, and therefore are subject to all miseries, yea, to condemnation itself, yet that they are sanctified in Christ, and therefore as members of His Church ought to be baptized. Secondly, whether you acknowledge the doctrine which is contained in the Old and New Testament and in the articles of the Christian faith, which is taught here in this Christian church to be the true and perfect or complete doctrine of salvation. Thirdly, whether you promise and intend to see these children when come to the years of discretion, instructed and brought up in the aforesaid doctrine, or help or cause them to be instructed therein to the utmost of your power. Brady and Dana, what is your answer? James and Joanna, what is your answer? We'll ask Brady and Dana to come forward first, and then James and Joanna. Thank you. Nora Quaker, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Elizabeth Corver, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing now, Psalm number 425, stanzas 4 and 5. 425, stanzas 4 and 5.
At this time, yet, we will now offer unto God the prayer of thanksgiving, and then we'll go directly from that into our congregational prayer. Let us pray to God. Almighty God and merciful Father, we thank and praise Thee that Thou hast forgiven us and our children all our sins through the blood of Thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ, and received us through Thy Holy Spirit as members of Thine only begotten Son, and adopted us to be Thy children, and sealed and confirmed the same unto us by holy baptism. We beseech Thee, through the same Son of Thy love, that Thou wilt be pleased always to govern these baptized children by Thy Holy Spirit, that they may be piously and religiously educated, they might increase and grow up in the Lord Jesus Christ, that they may then acknowledge Thy fatherly goodness and mercy, which Thou hast shown to them and us, and live in all righteousness under our only Teacher, King, and High Priest, Jesus Christ. And that they may manfully fight against and overcome sin, the devil, and his whole dominion, to the end that they may eternally praise and magnify Thee and Thy Son, Jesus Christ, together with the Holy Ghost, the one only true God. Yea, I am that I am, the God who keeps thy covenant from one generation to the next, the God who speaks, who will not silent be, the God who even in the morning hour of this day did give commandment that the snow and the sleet would come down. Thou art the God who didst bring us into this thy house of prayer, the God who is pleased to reveal Thyself unto us, who is not hidden from us, but who does give unto us to know Thee, which knowledge is life everlasting. We thank Thee, Father, for this day. We thank Thee for giving unto us a day of rest, where we can set aside our earthly labors, where we can enjoy sweet communion, Lord, with Thee. We thank Thee for giving unto us <clears throat> opportunities to have fellowship with the other members of the body of Jesus Christ. Father, how we yearn for this fellowship. But we need the words of encouragement and support one from another. We are all members of the body of Jesus Christ, and the eye cannot say unto the foot, I have no need of Thee. Wilt Thou bless us as a congregation? May we be preserved upon the old paths. May we be given a love for the truths which are found in Thy Word. May we be steadfast and immovable, always abounding in the work which Thou hast given unto us to perform. We pray, Father, seeking Thy blessing upon the needs of the members of this church. We thank Thee for the news that we have heard that Catherine Coiker has been able to return home from the hospital. We thank Thee as well that little baby Emerson was able to be released from the NICU. Will Thou, Father, grant healing and growth and strength Wilt thou be with those who continue to receive treatment? Go with Joel Van Ginkel as he receives treatment for cancer. Wilt thou use this for his well being to restore him gently and powerfully unto health if it be thy will? We seek as well comfort from thee. Wilt thou be in this time with the Wester family as they mourn the death of a family member? Grant unto them, Father, consolation as they go through the valley of the shadow of death. May they know that thou art God, the God who keeps thy promises, 
the God who never neglects or abandons thine own, but the God who is with us, who preserves us, the God who uses death as a doorway by which thy children are brought into life everlasting. We pray, Father, for the office bearers of this church. We are thankful for godly elders, deacons, pastor. Wilt thou grant unto the elders the strength and courage that they need week by week as they carry out the many responsibilities before them. Grant unto them understanding of thy word. May they be men who understand the times in which we live. May they be men then who can lead thy church in a way that is pleasing unto thee, in a way that promotes unity and the peace of Jerusalem. Wilt thou uphold as well the deacons? Wilt thou fill their hearts with grace and with the knowledge of Jesus Christ? And then, Father, as they taste of thy goodness, may they in turn deal in grace and loving kindness with the members of thy sheepfold. Wilt thou, Father, anoint us with thy Holy Spirit? Wilt thou give unto us a rich blessing in the worship service this morning? We are thankful for thy word. Thy word is precious unto us. We esteem it more highly than what we esteem anything else on this earth. A word is sweeter to our lips than honey from the honeycomb. We treasure thy word more than what we desire, the silver and gold of this earth. Wilt thou, Father, apply thy word unto our hearts? Wilt thou use thy word to comfort us? to exhort us unto godliness? And wilt thou as well use thy word to humble us? For we confess in this day that we gather as those who are sinners. We have broken thy commandments, indeed all of them. By nature, Father, we do not love thee with that zeal that we ought to have within our hearts. By nature, we are prone even to hate both thee and the neighbor. There's pride and selfishness that is found within each and every one of our hearts. Father, we confess unto thee our sins, and we plead of thee, wilt thou graciously forgive us? Wilt thou make us to be holy? Wash us so that we might be whiter than the new fallen snow. Grant unto us the finished work of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Wilt thou justify the ungodly? Wilt thou give salvation to us and to our children? Wilt thou use the preaching of thy word in this morning, Father, to reveal unto us more and more our sins? And then to direct our eyes unto our only hope, which is in Jesus Christ. Uphold and strengthen our pastor. Give unto him what he needs that he might utter in faith the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Thou grant unto him clarity of thought, recollection of what he has meditated upon, that he might then be able to speak of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Wilt thou hear this prayer? Wilt thou lead us in paths of righteousness? For Jesus' sake we pray this. Amen. Two collections this morning. The first collection is for the cause of the general fund. And the second is for the cause of benevolence.
Let's sing now Psalm number 359. 359. Titled Conscious Dependence on God. Stanza 3. Lo, children are a great reward, a gift from God in very truth. Let's sing the four stanzas of 359. Let us turn in God's Word this morning to the familiar and beloved 23rd Psalm. Psalm 23, entitled, A Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I swear we read God's holy an inspired word. May God bless the reading of the Holy Scriptures unto our hearts. The text that we consider for the sermon this morning is the first verse of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Beloved congregation in the Lord Jesus Christ, what makes Psalm 23 all the more meaningful to the child of God is the occupation that the human writer of this psalm had. 
The divine writer is God. The human writer is David. His occupation he was a shepherd. Throughout the early years of David's life, it was his responsibility to go out and care for the sheep that his father owned. David spent many days and many nights alone watching over these flocks. David understood very well and on a personal level the struggles that come with being a shepherd over the sheep. He knew the loneliness of that occupation. He knew the fears that come with being a shepherd. He had to defend the sheep against the lion and against the bear. And yet here in this text, the psalmist David does not speak of himself as the shepherd. But he acknowledges that there is a different person who is the shepherd. Here, the psalmist David, who himself was the shepherd, acknowledges he's the sheep. And someone else is the good shepherd. I am the sheep, and Jehovah is my shepherd. There was somebody else who shepherded David in a far better way than what David would ever have been able to shepherd himself. Someone who understood the nature of sheep and the needs of sheep with perfect wisdom. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Let's consider this text this morning under the theme, Jehovah, my shepherd. First, we'll consider this is a humble confession. Second, a confident confession. Third, an everlasting confession. This is a humbling confession, beloved, to take these words as your own words. To say, the Lord is my shepherd. And you know why it's humbling? Because to say that the Lord is my shepherd is to say, I am a sheep. It is to confess my own weakness and my vulnerability to proclaim that someone else is my shepherd. In biblical times, throughout present times, it is the duty of the shepherd to take care of sheep. It was not the duty of the shepherd to watch over the sturdy and resilient oxen. It was not the duty of the shepherd to tame the wild and rugged stallion. It was not the duty of the shepherd to domesticate the soaring eagle, but it was the duty of the shepherd to take care of lowly animals called sheep. Animals that were simple, animals that were earthbound, slow moving, not known for their brilliance, unable to defend themselves, unable even to lead themselves into the green pastures or to go beside the still waters where they, where they might drink, we are confessing in this psalm that we are sheep. And who wants to be called a sheep? Oftentimes in the political arena, the, world, the word sheep is tossed around as an insult unto those who oppose that individual. To be a sheep is to be one who doesn't understand what's going on around him or her. To be a sheep is to acknowledge that one is simply following the masses. To be a sheep is to acknowledge that I'm not an independent and free thinker. To be a sheep is to acknowledge that I depend upon the care and protection of someone else. 
To be a sheep is to confess that I would fall into that crevice and I would not be able to get myself out were it not for the help of someone else. There can be shame that is associated with the title sheep. The proud person would never admit that the Lord is my shepherd. For the proud person would say, I am that courageous lion. I am not a sheep. But God humbles us. He humbles us even through and perhaps especially through parenting, which reveals unto us we are but sheep. As God sends us through the trials of this life, as God sends hardship after hardship, God slowly, incrementally strips us of our pride, strips us of our thinking that we are independent, strips us of our thinking that we can stand on our own two feet, and God more and more reveals unto us that we are sheep. While it is the case that the world might use the word sheep as a taunt and a form of mockery, the Bible does not use the word sheep in such a way. It ascribes no such insult to the word, but instead, this is Jehovah God's own description of His covenant people. The people whom God chose to be His own sons and daughters. The one whom God has taken into His family, the one whom God purchased with the shed blood of His own Son, Jesus Christ, whom God delivered out of the captivity of Egypt, whom God gave unto them manna from heaven and water from the rock, the ones who were preserved by God in the wilderness for 40 years, which wilderness was barren and otherwise insufficient to keep His covenant people alive, to these people whom God loves and considers to be the apple of His eye. God's Word is, you are my sheep. And I love you. And I do not look down upon you or belittle you because you are sheep. We who are God's children do not shy away from the term But we say with humility, the Lord is my shepherd. In distinction from the vulnerability and weaknesses of the sheep, there stands the powerful, the loving shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. In biblical times, it was the duty of the shepherd to feed the sheep. And it was the duty of the shepherd to defend the sheep. The next verse speaks of the shepherd feeding and leading the sheep. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His Name's sake. Not an easy task this was to be a shepherd in Palestine. For much of the land was barren. The shepherd had to be familiar with the terrain. He had to know where the green grass could be found at. He had to know the location of the oasis so that he could take the sheep and lovingly and gently lead the sheep unto the green pastures. And not only was it the case of the shepherd that the shepherd had to know the land, the lay of the land, but the shepherd also had to know the enemies that would threaten the sheep, who are the predators that would come and attack these vulnerable and defenseless sheep. There had to be great courage that was found in the one who is identified as a shepherd. Courage to stand up against the lion and the bear. Courage to use that rod in order to beat away the enemies that would attack the vulnerable sheep. 
This shepherd who defends his sheep and who provides for his people is Jehovah God. God is the one who leads his people. He leads us into green pastures where we may eat. He leads us beside the still waters where we may drink. And where is it that Jehovah God leads us unto? Himself. For He is the water, and He is the bread of life. Jesus, in John 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to Me shall never hunger. So God powerfully irresistibly and graciously leads his people by his word through the operations of the Holy Spirit and he draws us unto himself where our souls are nourished with the bread of life. How powerful is our shepherd and how loving is our shepherd, the Lord, Jehovah, is my shepherd. Have you considered before what this means for God to be counted a shepherd? When we look at this text, we oftentimes look at the text from the point of view of what does this mean for me? What blessings and benefits do I derive from the fact that God is my shepherd? But now I urge of you, look at this from the point of view of God. What does this mean for God that God is counted here in this text as a shepherd? If you think of who it is that normally had the position of a shepherd, it was not the high and the mighty who were shepherds. It was not the important rulers, the important dignitaries of this earth who occupied the position of being a shepherd. If one was a shepherd, usually being a shepherd would be the starting place of one's career, as it were. He'd begin in his youth as a shepherd, but then he would move on to what might be considered more important, more prestigious positions and callings. David, for example, as a young man, he started out as a shepherd tending over his father's sheep. But David did not remain forever in that position, but he graduated on to something more important. He became the king over the nation of Israel, a powerful and important man who led the troops into battle and who fought against the enemies of God's nation. Consider Moses, who likewise spent 40 years in the wilderness tending to sheep, but then after that he graduated, he moved on to being the leader of God's people, taking God's people out of Egypt and into the promised land of Canaan. And thus it is then that to be a shepherd is hardly considered the pinnacle of one's career. Oftentimes, who are the shepherds? It was a hired hand. Abraham had many different flocks, and he had servants, hired hands, who would go out and be the shepherds to take care of those flocks. Job, a wealthy, wealthy man, had hired hands to go out and take care of all of his flocks. And now we are saying in this verse, the Almighty God is a shepherd. Do you behold, beloved, the condescension of our God? He who is the eternal God, the I am that I am, 
the God who is and who was and who forever shall remain, the Almighty, the unchanging, the Lord of hosts, the uncreated, uncaused God, chooses to be a shepherd. He does not simply hire the work out to someone else and have the hired hand do the work of being a shepherd to his people. But through his Son, Jesus Christ, he condescended into this world to be the shepherd of his sheep. The independent God. The God who is not influenced by the thinking and the will of man. This God has determined that he will be the everlasting and perfect shepherd. How loving is it of our God to reveal Himself to us in the Holy Scriptures as the Good Shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. This is the present reality for the child of God. The psalmist is not expressing a longing for the future. He is not saying, I hope someday that the Almighty God will be my shepherd. But right now, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. And whatever the circumstances of your life might be, and whatever trials, burdens, or rejoicing and happiness that is yours, This is your confession. The Lord is my shepherd. Knowing that Jehovah, the Almighty God, is our shepherd, we then have great confidence as we go through this earthly pilgrimage. The confidence we have is expressed in the second half of this first verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Because God is my shepherd, I shall not want. I can remember as a child struggling to understand what this means, I shall not want. As a young child, I and perhaps other children had a misunderstanding of this verse. Understood it to mean this way, the Lord is my shepherd that I shall not want. Well, that doesn't make any sense to say that the Lord is the shepherd that I shall not want. We are not saying here that God is the shepherd and we don't want God as our shepherd. Instead, we're saying God is my shepherd. And now because God is my shepherd, therefore, I do not have any wants or any needs. I will receive what it, what it is that God has willed that I am to receive. This does not mean I have no want. It does not mean that we'll never have any other desires. It does not mean that we can get absolutely whatever our heart wants. That we can dream loftily of what earthly ambitions we're going to have. And then, well, because God is my shepherd, now I have His stamp of approval on desiring whatever it is that I, that I want, then I know that God will give it unto me because He is the Almighty God. No, that's not the idea here of saying, I shall not want. But rather it's this, Jehovah will give unto me exactly what I need. And He is the one who determines what I need. That's the basic idea of the word want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not need, want. Same word is used in Exodus chapter 16, which speaks of the Israelites collecting their manna in the wilderness as that manna fell down from heaven. Exodus 16, verse 18, And when they did meet or measure it with an omer, he that gathered much had nothing over, And he that gathered little had no lack. They gathered every man according to 
his eating. And the words translated had no lack are the same root word, same as the root word found in this text, I shall not want. The one who is God's child will have everything provided for him that is necessary for his soul and for his body. To say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is an expression of contentment. By nature, this is something that we never would say, I shall not want, because there are so many different things that our nature does want. Who wouldn't want to be able to lose five pounds? Who wouldn't want to have a little bit more money in the bank? Who wouldn't want to have more health, more stability upon this earth? And then these desires that we have are not limited to ourselves, but as well, there is selfishness that is found in our children. The sinful desires, sinful self-centeredness that parents have is also found in children. There's selfishness that's bound up in the heart of children by nature. And as children go through this earth, they reveal more and more that selfishness, that lack of contentment that they have. They cry and complain when things do not go their way. And so it is the case then to say, I shall not want, that is, I will be content, is a learned truth. Parents must learn this truth to be content with what Jehovah has given unto them. And parents must spend their entire lives learning this truth of contentment. The contentment that the Christian has arises not because the conditions of life are exactly what one wanted them to be, but this contentment instead arises from the knowledge that Jehovah is my shepherd. And I believe that Jehovah will give unto me exactly what I need at the exact moment in time that will be sufficient to guide me and lead me unto Himself, Jehovah God. I shall not want. Mothers learn to say this. I shall not want. I am not going to look enviously at what God has given the neighboring mother. I will not be jealous of the abilities God has given her. I will not be jealous of the way she dresses her children. I will not be jealous of the way she decorates her home. I will not be jealous of the type of food she makes. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And fathers must learn to make this confession, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm not going to look at what God has given the neighbor for an income and then compare my income to the neighbor's income and be jealous of that. I'm not going to look at how many different responsibilities the neighbor is able to juggle in his life without apparently becoming overwhelmed or stressed out. I'm not going to compare myself to him. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'm not going to look as a male at the number of possessions that God has given to the neighbor at the size of his home at the year or make and model of the vehicle that he drives and then jealously covet what God has given to the neighbor, but instead, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But not only is this an expression of contentment, 
This also is an expression of trust in Jehovah God. To say, I shall not want, is to say, I will not worry about tomorrow. I am not fearful of what the future looks like. If Jehovah is my shepherd, what could I possibly lack or be in need of? This goes against our nature, which tends toward fearfulness, and especially in the context of parenting. This nature of parents is revealed worrying about children. It seems there are a thousand and one things that could go wrong in parenting. How will I care for this child? How will I provide for this child? How will I, how will I protect this child, especially in the day and age in which we live, in which wickedness abounds, in which the devil has greater levels of deviousness, of bringing evil devices even into the homes and placed in the hands of children? And how am I going to protect my children against all of these evils that are found in this world? How will I order the steps of my children according to the desires of Jehovah God? How am I going to educate sufficiently this child so that when this child comes to years of discretion, he or she is ready to take his place as an adult in this world? And speaking of this world, what if my child is alive at the end of this world? What if my children or my grandchildren are alive when the great tribulation comes upon this earth when there is worldwide persecution, when the devil is given the ability to drive the members of the church unto the hills so that they must escape, seek escape from the devil and his torments. All of these questions can rise up in and occupy a place in the mind of the parent as he seeks to rear up children in the midst of this world. And the parrot must be reminded again, the Lord, Jehovah, is my shepherd. I shall not want. The eyes of the Christian are to be directed not at all of the things of this earth that would be the cause for worry and concern. But the eyes of the Christian are to be directed unto the shepherd. Recall, we are but sheep. And sheep are not known for their brilliant insights. Who are we to think? that we know what is best. Who are we to think that our plan is better than the shepherd's plan? We must daily renounce our own will and without murmuring, submit unto the will of the good shepherd. The shepherd has plans that go beyond the plans of the sheep. The shepherd understands things that we who are sheep will never be able to comprehend upon this earth. It is the duty of the sheep then not to call the ways of the shepherd into judgment, but it is the duty of the sheep to follow by faith the way of the good shepherd. The goal of the shepherd is that his name would be exalted in the salvation and preservation of His elect people. The goal of the Good Shepherd is that His name would be exalted above every other name that is named upon this earth, that every knee would bend and worship Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Sometimes this means then that the Good Shepherd leads His sheep into very low places, yea, He leads us through the valley of the shadow of death, 
so that we might be stripped of our pride and that more and more we might exalt and praise the name of our God. He puts us in this valley for a reason so that we might see all the more His transcendence as the God of our salvation. He takes us out of the pit and He sets us upon the rock which is higher than us. This is, beloved, our everlasting confession. Jehovah, my shepherd. It's a confession that we make all the days of our life and it's a confession that we will make into eternity. The psalm concludes with this, verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This we know, that God will always be our shepherd. There are so many other things that we do not. No, we do not know how many days God will be pleased to keep us on this earth. We do not know how many days God will be pleased to give us with our children and with our grandchildren. We do not know what burdens will come tomorrow, what trials will be ours. But this we know, that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For the Lord is our shepherd. This is the confession that we make by faith. Faith which is the substance of things hoped for. Faith the evidence of things not seen. By faith, we believe that the Good Shepherd is. And that the Good Shepherd is the Redeemer of the sheep. By faith, we believe that the Good Shepherd loves His sheep, even to the point of giving up His own life. He is not the hireling, the hired hand, who flees in the face of adversity, but he is the Good Shepherd who has a vested interest in the sheep. He loves the sheep because the Father gave the sheep to him in the eternal decree of election. Jesus, the Good Shepherd, loved the sheep to the point of his own death on that accursed tree. The shepherd condescended to the depths of hell so that we might be freed from sin and the guilt of it. Thanks be to God that he is our Good Shepherd. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father and our God in heaven, we are thankful for Thy Word. We are thankful that we can call Thee our Shepherd. Wilt Thou strengthen, bless, bless us as parents, Wilt thou give unto us faith to believe that thou wilt supply our every need? Wilt thou, Father, strengthen our faith more and more that we might look unto thy beloved Son, Jesus Christ? Wilt thou graciously forgive whatever was done or said in sin? Wilt thou receive our worship for Jesus' sake? Amen.
Let's sing now Psalter number 55. Number 55 based on Psalm 23. The Lord my shepherd holds me within his tender care, and with his flock he folds me. No want shall find me there. Let's sing the three stanzas, Psalter number 55. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen.